So it's with very great pleasure that I welcome you to this webinar. It's a joint webinar jointly hosted um, by <clears throat> the Cambridge Centre for Corporate and Commercial Law, we call it Free CL in Cambridge, and the Cambridge Private Law Centre. Um, I'm Louise Gallifrey, I'm one of the co-directors of 3CL and I'm going to chair this webinar, but we're really delighted that the seminar is going to be chaired with the Private Law Centre. And that's, that's worked very well for a couple of seminars we've done this term. Now, before I introduce our speaker, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, first of all, on the 3CL website, if you haven't already seen it, there's a document you might like to look at at some stage called Concept Note 2. It's an update of the original concept note that was drafted at the commencement of the project that we're going to hear about. And um, also after the webinar, there'll be some notes from the webinar on, that will be a, a, available for you to download. Um, Daniel's going to put that up on the 3CL website. Secondly, um, Bill has kindly agreed to have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, if you could possibly follow this procedure, if you'd like to ask a question or make a point or have an intervention, please could you type it in the Q&A, not in the chat, I'll monitor the Q&A, and then when I call on you, because I'll, I'll moderate the questions, we'll make you a panellist so you can be heard and seen, and everyone can hear your question, and you don't have to have it just read out by me. So you will get a chance to ask the question, but I think we've disabled the raise hand function, please use the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> please, we've got students from Cambridge as well as academics from Cambridge and elsewhere, and if you're a student, please don't be shy, please do ask questions and join in the discussion great to have you with us. So I'd now like to introduce our speaker today and to welcome him to Cambridge, virtually of course, he's not in Cambridge and actually neither am I, but anyway, welcome Bill. Um, Bill, it's really nice to have you with us. So Sir William, Bill Blair has had basically three careers all going on at the same time for most of his life. He had a glittering career at the English Bar as a member of 3VB, um, both as a junior and a silk, and then became judge in charge of London's commercial court. Um, after retiring as a judge, recently he's returned to Chambers as a member of the International Advisory and Dispute Resolution Unit. He has various judicial roles in the Middle East and in China and is a qualified mediator. Second, he has over the years had a number of academic roles as visiting professor in the LSE and various other universities and is now a professor of financial law and ethics at the Centre for Commercial Law Studies, um, Queen Mary University of London. Thirdly, he has played many roles in public bodies connected with banking and finance and continues to do so. For example, he is chair of the Bank of England's Enforcement Decision-Making Committee and was the first president of the Board of Appeal of the European Supervisory Authorities. He chairs the Monetary Law Committee of the International Law Association and is a member of London's Financial Markets Law Committee. Now, I am very lucky because I've been lucky enough to know Bill for many, many years, starting some time back now, when I was a pupil in the chambers that became 3VB. Bill has always been a, a wonderful, a superb technical lawyer and advocate, but he has also, also, also always uh, concerned himself, as we do in academia, with what the law should be, how the law should develop, and particularly in the light of changing circumstances in which the commercial and financial world finds itself. Now, it's hard to think of circumstances that are quite so unusual, as those in which we find ourselves today. <clears throat> many people have commented on this, many are actually in practice struggling with this. Uh, Bill decided to actually do something about it and he started the Breathing Space Project based at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law to investigate the approach of different legal systems around the world to commercial contracts during the pandemic and consider what could be done further. So we're very fortunate today that Bill has agreed to come and speak to us about it and introduce the project. So I will now hand over to Bill. Thank you, Bill. So Louise, um, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thanks to the Center for Commercial, Corporate and Commercial Law, 3CL and uh, Cambridge Private Law Center. Uh, and th uh, thank you all who've joined. Uh, I think if you uh, jo joined a, a uh, about uh, three or four minutes ago, you, you may have heard Louise say that um, <clears throat> she hoped we'd have a really, really interesting lecture. I'm not sure I can imagine a, manage a really, really interesting lecture, but I'll try and manage an, an interesting one. And it certainly, as she says, is a, a really, really uh, interesting and frankly, really, really important subject. 
So uh, let me begin with uh, some um, you know, general comments to try to um, uh, paint in the background. And uh, you know, we're all <clears throat> by now getting quite expert in the epidemiology and vaccines and so on. Uh, but let me try and shift it a little bit uh, towards the subject of commercial contracts. So I, I don't really think <clears throat> that uh, in uh, late January uh, 2020, early February 2020, when you know we heard about the um, news from uh, Wuhan, I don't think anyone seriously thought that we would be now where we are. And you know, as you know, uh, where we are is that particularly in um, Europe and the United States, things are, are far from improving have actually uh, deteriorated quite rapidly. But here's the point when it comes to global trade and global contracts. <clears throat> the picture isn't uniform. Uh, for various reasons, East Asia has done much better than Europe, for example. But there's been a price that's had to be paid for that. And you know, we know uh, part of the price, but part of it that's very relevant for the subject we're discussing is the quarantine that's been imposed uh, by, by all these countries uh, in, in East Asia and around, around the world. And uh, uh, in many ways, I think, um, nothing shows the effect of the pandemic better than its effect on international travel. And uh, let, me, let me show you a slide. I, I should be thanking, by the way, Car Carlos Cavallo, who's uh, uh, fr from my unit in 3VB, who's ki kindly helping with the slides. But he he here's a slide. You may have to um, shift it around a little bit. I'm going to sh shift my picture around a little bit. But uh, this slide shows uh, world passenger traffic evolution from 1945, when uh, air traffic uh, really started to pick up after the end of the war, Second World War, up to now. And uh, this was updated by uh, a body called the um, International Civil Aviation Organization. It's uh, ICAO. It's based in um, Montreal. And uh, this is updated as of the 12th of November. And you can see the, uh, you know, the kind of headline, uh, decline in world total passengers uh, between 59% and 60% as projected to the end of 2020, where we, we nearly are at present. But here's the point I want to make based on this slide and picking up the point that Professor Gulliver made just, just a moment ago. T -t -take, take a look at the other 20th, 20th century and 21st century crises, the oil crisis, uh, the uh, Iran, uh, Iraq war, the Gulf crisis, then the Asian crisis. And what uh, is being talked about here is the Asian crisis at the uh, end of the 1990s, which was a financial crisis. Then of course, 9-11. And uh, if you can see, there is a, a, a noticeable dip after 9-11 uh, in um, world passenger traffic evolution. Then we get to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and you can see there very clearly a plateau. You can also see how it's um, uh, uh, recovered rapidly and grown rapidly. And then look at the end of uh, 2020, and what's happened is that the uh, passenger numbers have gone uh, over the cliff. And so that's what's happened. And uh, of course, uh, it's an illustration. And, um, but other fields of economic activity show the same kind of patterns. And there are exceptions, the financial markets, for example, they had a, a, a kind of collapse in March 2020. There was then vast liquidity pumped in by central banks and governments, and uh, they uh, staged a recovery. They're recovering again now on talk of vaccine. But um, re re really, what I think that slide does is to make a point that we've all got to face. 
and that is that there hasn't been a crisis of anything like the seriousness of this for global trade uh, since 1945, not even close. And so uh, that's why um, we uh, uh, should be, uh, in the view of a lot of us, um, approaching these events and, and saying, well, you know, is, is it, are we really still okay um, with the existing toolbox? I mean, you can say it's uh, many respects served, served well since 1945, not in all respects. Sustainability, for example, is one respect in which it most certainly has not uh, served us well. But um, uh, is, it, is that really credible uh, given um, uh, uh, where we are and even, even allowing for what I hope will happen, what we all hope will happen in um, 2021, uh, some kind of V-shaped recovery you know, when um, the vaccines become available, uh, confidence may roar back. It's all a matter of confidence when it comes to most things in human life and certainly international uh, trade and commerce is one of them. Uh, yes, uh, that may happen, but um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we're, we're certainly uh, nowhere uh, near that just at the present time. So let, a few more points, if I may, about the, the, uh, the background. Again, I've made the point that the picture isn't uniform, and I, I made that point geographically a moment ago. But let me make it now in a different way. And uh, uh, here, um, to, to pick up what the WTO, WTO has said about it, and this, I think, is, is a good summary. Uh, COVID-19 has devastated trade in certain types of goods, but it's encouraged trade in other types of goods. Pharmaceuticals are an obvious example, but they're certainly not the only ones that uh, the uh, st stay-at-home products uh, have uh, soared again, as we know. While we're on background, here's another uh, very important point that I think we have to uh, face up to. We, um, and I say we, what I'm kind of meaning ge generically by we uh, are people who are in Cambridge either um, actually or remotely, we tend to be looking at the direct consequences of the virus. But um, let me make this point because it's a, a very important one when it comes to the, uh, the um, issues that uh, I want to develop later on this afternoon. The indirect effects of the crisis for emerging markets have been uh, not only uh, as serious, um, but uh, pr probably more serious than um, the, the uh, uh, di direct effects. And, and he here's the example that I'd like to put to you. You take a, a, a Zambia, um, uh, it's got a, a population of 17 million, one seven million. As of a few days ago, uh, its reported COVID-19 cases were 17,000, one seven thousand, with 350 deaths. Now, th th that is a, a far lower uh, level than uh, any country in Europe. Uh, I, I would, I would think, certainly um, far, far lower than Britain. But and uh, there's the uh, report, the, uh, I think it's an FT, or that's, that's a Reuters report on the, uh, on the le left. Um, Zambia, at the time of this report, was uh, on the brink of default, but actually went into default on Friday. And it's the first, uh, Africa's, Africa's first country to declare uh, COVID-19 default. And by default, we mean default in its sovereign debt, which of course is a, an absolutely crucial aspect of how you deal with COVID-19. We know that from Britain, uh, the liquidity which is being pumped into our, our economy has come through a ballooning sovereign debt. 
Now, uh, that is not available. Uh, that kind of thing is not available for many uh, countries in the world, and not just the uh, poorer ones, which were on the right-hand si side of that slide. There, the World Bank has um, uh, uh, pushed, with some success, um, a, uh, a moratorium. But people need to agree to a moratorium. They don't, they don't just happen. And, and so, so far, that hasn't really been happening. So you have uh, leading commentators like uh, Lee Bockheit and Sean Hagen that uh, some of you will know about, who are warning about uh, an incipient sovereign debt crisis. So uh, individual cases aside, because of the unpredictable nature of the crisis and the longer it goes on, we have to expect a continuing impact on trade and commerce, particularly supply chains, which we hear about so often. And this has the potential to become cu cumulative. Now, uh, there's a rhetorical question which uh, I'm posing in these remarks, and uh, it's this, uh, whether, to, whether in order to avoid a plethora of defaults, and, and that, by the way, is Mario Draghi's phrase. He was, as you know, uh, the first, uh, the, the boss of the European Central Bank until very recently. Whether to avoid a plethora of defaults arising from a crisis, we should be looking at new ways of resolving commercial disputes or, and, and this is a, um, picking up on something that has become much, much more to the fore during this crisis. Should we be focusing on technology and seeing how that can accommodate and ultimately uh, enhance legal proceedings? Of course, that's the subject of what we're talking about this afternoon, legal proceedings. And uh, let me just um, make this point. The field we're looking at is commercial contracts, but this isn't a niche concern. It's not something that's out there on the periphery, although uh, I suspect that some policymakers might regard it as being out there on the periphery. But, but why do I say that? Well, uh, the reason is an obvious one, that these international commercial contracts are, in a very real sense, the lifeblood of international commerce. They provide the legal framework within which international commerce works. And if they become disrupted, and uh, particularly for the purposes of this discussion, if they become disrupted by disputes, so that relationships which have come under stress, but, but which might have been able to have been kept going had a, a particular attitude prevailed, in fact, get ruptured because the parties get into, uh, into disputes and you end up with a, a zero sum game. Uh, you know, how is that going to impact on the recovery that we all hope is going to come? And so what, I, what I, I want to emphasize is that what happens to these contracts is important now, because that's true in both a positive sense and in a negative sense. Contractual continuity can keep trade flowing. Uh, equally, contractual discontinuity can impede the recovery and have the opposite effect. Now, uh, th this is what lies behind uh, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law's Breathing Space project. And uh, as uh, Professor Gulliver said, um, this uh, uh, is a, pro a project that, I, uh, that I'm involved in, but I, she didn't actually say this, but she's involved in it, it as well and uh, is a, um, a, a very valued member of it, I may say. Uh, right at the top of the uh, pyramid of the people who are um, looking at these issues at the British Institute are two former presidents of the UK Supreme Court, um, Lord Newberger uh, and Lord Phillips. A and uh, we uh, call it a, a breathing space project because 
our concern has been to see how it's possible to uh, angle international con uh, contractual disputes in a way that gives parties space to resolve those disputes rather than end up in uh, in uh, litigation or arbitration, which results in the discontinuity that I was talking about a little earlier. What I'm going to do now is to uh, talk a little bit about what kind of disputes the pandemic is throwing up. And in other words, um, where are we in terms of contractual disputes now that we were not, for example, in November 2019. And uh, in terms of legal characterization, it's possible to identify three main heads. And per perhaps we could have the next slide. So uh, first of all, uh, force measure. Secondly, material adverse change and similar clauses. And thirdly, the possible discharge of contracts by legal doctrines such as frustration, supervening illegality, and impossibility. And I, I, I made a, a, a point on this slide, a, a basic point, which is that the legal effect of these under uh, any system of law is fact specific in every case. And that's a point I'm going to come back to, but it, it is a very important one to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, le let me make another uh, similar point that these terms are not always used in the same sense. Uh, it partly depends what legal system you're in. Uh, as I think we, we all know, English law is very widely used internationally in commerce and finance, but of course it's um, one of many systems and more generally, um, and in relation to the, the those three um, uh, uh, types of dispute that I've identified, the civil law and the common law take in, in some respects different approaches. And that's something I'll, I'll highlight in uh, my remarks shortly. But let me begin with uh, force majeure. And um, force majeure uh, clauses are uh, very common. Uh, they uh, relieve a party of liability for performance under three conditions that uh, the performance is caused by an event. And uh, you see on the slide, the, the three conditions, it's beyond that party's control. It couldn't reasonably have been foreseen when the contract was concluded and it couldn't have been avoided or overcome. And th those really are the three um, uh, um, uh, ground rules, if you like, when it comes to force majeure. Uh, here's the difference between the civil law and the, the common law, because civil law jurisdictions, in fact, usually include force majeure provisions in their civil codes. Common law jurisdictions usually do not. Of course, in uh, many of our common law systems, we don't have a civil code as such, but uh, uh, force majeure is, is not normally uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in enacted form. But, uh, the difference is not as great as, as might be thought. And why do I say that? Well, um, for the obvious reason that in, when it comes to commercial contracts, whether whatever law they're governed by, it's the terms that the parties have agreed that, are, uh, the, uh, that will prevail and are the most important thing. So that's the first head. The second head is material adverse change. And um, here you're talking about a uh, contractual doc doctrine, again, so far as the common law is concerned. So MAC clauses uh, and similar permit a party to exit from a transaction on the occurrence of a fundamental change in the other party's ability to perform its obligations due to, and this is what, uh, this is the normal condition, due to a deterioration in its financial position. 
Now you uh, see these clauses routinely in finance documents. You see them routinely in m and that is corporate uh, acquisition documents. They're rarely invoked, by the way, R rarely invoked. Uh, but it so happens, um, not surprisingly maybe, that uh, they've been revoked in, in a, a major case recently on whether a fintech company can walk away for a walk away from a deal to buy two travel payment businesses because of the effects of the pandemic. This is a, a highly contested case and is one of a number of uh, M day cases that are going on in uh, London right now and of course in Delaware, which is the the center of um, uh, corporate law for the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, here, uh, the courts are, the courts are going to have to uh, decide how uh, how how uh, the uh, material adverse uh, change clause actually gives a an out um, to the prospective buyer and lets the prospective buyer off the the hook. I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to come back to that. Just uh, before before leaving it though. And uh, I mentioned earlier the difference between civil law and common law, and, and you, you get that again here uh, in um, not quite not quite yet, Carlos. We'll, we'll go. We'll stick on that one. Thank you. Uh, in civil law, codes uh, uh, often contain comparable provisions, such as uh, en prévision in the French civil code. But the, there's a there's a very interesting. Uh, difference between the common law and the civil law in approach that I just want to highlight for you. And that is that a feature of some of the provisions in civil codes are to enable a court to uh, adapt the contractual terms. Uh, in China, which of course generates um, uh, now uh, an appreciable volume of uh, global trade. The Supreme People's Court has issued guidance as to how the, these provisions in Chinese law are to be applied in the light of the pandemic. And they, they have a, a, a similar provisions to the provisions in the, uh, the German code in China. But, uh, and I, uh, um, have this information from a, um, a Chinese judge. The judiciary has been quite slow to um, apply them. Why is that? Because when it comes to international commercial contracts, my, my guess is that uh, most judges would be uh, rather cautious before adapting the terms of a party's contract. But anyway, so far as the common law is concerned, certainly the English common law, that is not a, 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 a even available to judges in theory. So uh, 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 next slide, please. The uh, doctrines such as um, uh, frustration, uh, supervening illegality, um, impossibility, uh, these doctrines apply in both the civil law and the common law under various different names. And uh, uh, here, um, an interesting decision in the civil law from Spain, where a court has dealt with a case where a steel group is resisting payment of bank loans. And you can see on the slide what the court has said, and it gives perhaps some uh, indication of how, well, certainly the courts in that, in that country um, looked, at, looked at the issue uh, well known that the COVID-19 pandemic caused a drastic drop in production and um, demand, uh, an exceptional um, and unprecedented situation um, as COVID-19 uh, paralyzed the world uh, economy. And then uh, I think we may have missed off a little, little bit at the bottom there, but uh, finally it was necessary to adapt contract law institutions. And I think the court went on to say to the social reality as it is now, 
And uh, that um, perhaps is something that all, all of us can uh, relate to, even if, as I've said on the uh, right here, um, it's, it's, it's unlikely, I think, that uh, a common law court would take quite such a, um, uh, a, ro a robust approach. Um, frustration is something which is, is uh, uh, difficult to prove in, in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, English law. Just a word about supervening illegality. Uh, when might supervening illegality uh, uh, bite? And I, I think it's perhaps important to uh, give this a, a little bit of thought because uh, depending on when the pandemic ends, uh, we may see m more um, government intervention. I mean, to take an example, suppose you have a, uh, a factory um, that, that is uh, pr producing um, uh, components for motor vehicles and uh, on, on government direction, it stops doing that and starts producing medical supplies. Uh, there, uh, uh, the, uh, there, the supplier may have the, a defense based on supervening illegality without having to necessarily look at um, more difficult doctrines such as frustration. But uh, here's the point I want to stress uh, in relation to all these doctrines, and really it's the legal backdrop to the Breathing Space project. In relation to all these doctrines, the legal analysis will depend on the individual contract and the facts of the individual case. And uh, th th this is a very important point to bear in mind when you're considering the law and COVID-19 in this commercial context. It, it may seem very obvious to a business person that their contract uh, has been traduced by COVID-19. But uh, so far as the law is concerned, the path to establishing legal liability may be uh, and uh, very often will be far from predictable and will certainly include uh, issues of causation. So th th that's the, um, the uh, legal background then. And uh, let me now focus on the, um, the, the thinking of the uh, breathing uh, space project as to uh, how in these circumstances we're uh, best to um, move forward. Now, uh, we do not, of course, suggest that legal proceedings should generally be avoided. Um, that's a matter of judgment for parties and their legal advisors. Legal proceedings are um, often going to be inevitable. But we do make this point that in a crisis like the present, it's important to recognize that there is a public interest in play as well as a private interest. And, and uh, uh, this point applies despite the fact that we're in the uh, realm of private law now, despite the fact that we're in the realm of contracts, and despite the fact that uh, um, modern contract law uh, is um, uh, reflective largely of uh, laissez-faire uh, principles going back a, a long time. But, but there is a, a public interest that this pandemic has generated. It's also the case that in some respects, uh, litigation can be actually constructive rather than destructive. Now, uh, um, I think many uh, of us will be aware of the test case which has been brought by the Financial Conduct Authority, which is one of the U uh, UK financial regulators against various insurance companies. And the subject of that case, of course, is business interruption insurance. And it's a very live issue in this pandemic 
because on the one hand, you have uh, many businesses and many uh, small businesses which have got uh, business interruption cover and uh, th that cover, if available, would make a, a, a very great difference to how they cope with the pandemic. But on the other side, you've got uh, vast potential liabilities for insurance companies. So unsurprisingly, uh, this is a, um, go going to be a difficult area to resolve. Uh, and uh, th that's why the FCA has brought this test case. And uh, again, some of us will have seen the, the lengthy judgment that was handed down uh, in September. The court analyzed 21 different types of insurance policy issued by um, various different insurers. It is certainly the case now, it's certainly clear that coverage can be available for COVID-19 business interruption cases. However, and th this is the real uh, qualification, liability in individual cases depends on applying the principles to the individual facts. And, and, and that's why, uh, as I uh, made a point I made a number of times, all these cases do come back to that in the end. By the way, uh, as uh, some of you will have <clears throat> seen, there uh, uh, was an appeal to the Supreme Court on this case. Uh, the appeal started yesterday it goes on until Thursday. Uh, it is actually happening today, but it's not actually happening right now because it's the luncheon break. But uh, uh, for, for anyone who wants to catch up with it um, afterwards, it's uh, being, being, being live streamed. But uh, I don't know whether, whether the plan was that this um, seminar was fixed for one o'clock to, to avoid uh, uh, conflict with court times, but anyway, it has very neatly done that today. So now back to the Breathing Space project. <clears throat> we published our first concept note back in April, back in April, and uh, it, it honestly, I'm sure you all agree, seems like a long time ago. One of the things we warned of was the risk of a deluge of um, litigation and arbitration. And the way, way we put it, and I'm reading now, the risk of a deluge of litigation and arbitration placing a strain on the system of international dispute resolution and reducing the prospect of more constructive solutions and increasing the prospect of uncertainty of outcome. Those two points are both Im important, I think, and I've tried to um, uh, make them already, but let me just uh, f focus on, on them a, a moment. Firstly, there's the possibility of something more constructive than a deluge of litigation. And secondly, and this is a point that I've also emphasized, there's the question of uncertainty of outcome. <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, repeat what I've said about, about that. Now we're in November. And uh, so far as I'm aware, uh, there are no empirical studies on COVID-19 commercial disputes. Uh, it's um, anecdotally, it seems that in the immediate aftermath of the spread of the, um, the virus, business was really in uh, very much in survival mode often. Uh, it certainly wasn't concerned with uh, pursuing disputes, but uh, that now um, seems to uh, be changing. And as I said, anecdotally, there do appear to have been a growing number of disputes going to courts, courts like the commercial court and they're in London and their equivalents elsewhere in the world. And of course, international arbitration, which is uh, very important for international commerce generally, as, uh, as I think you all are very well aware. <clears throat> Just an aside, if I may, the uh, 
um, the fact that there are a great number of disputes has meant that the legal community of which we are after all all, all members has been uh, affected disproportionately by COVID-19. <clears throat> there are some, uh, the, the, those uh, legal um, firms or uh, uh, groups of barristers uh, who specialize in uh, subjects like commercial law are extremely busy. Uh, uh, th those groups that are dealing um, in, uh, say, criminal cases are not. And uh, one of the points I'm going to come to in just a moment when, when I talk a little bit about technology is there is a lot of difference <clears throat> between the uh, technological um, uh, sit, uh, position when it comes to a commercial dispute and the technological position when it comes to a criminal trial. And at, at least one of the reasons and probably the most important reason is the absence of a jury in um, civil disputes in the, uh, at least in the English branch of the common law. Of course, they're, they're there in the American branch. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a jury, um, it is um, considerably more difficult to um, put on a, a remote hearing, but, but we're, we're not in that, in, in that field. So let me um, give you uh, a few examples. We've had some already of the, uh, the breadth of the disputes and then I'll come to technology. A very early example and actually a, a, an important one comes from the uh, nuclear, nuclear industry. And um, th that's a, a decision that comes from France, a decision of the uh, Tribunal de Commerce de Paris, the French Commercial Court, um, handed down in May 2020. And that found contractual force majeure established in the case of the effect of the virus and um, producing a, a base brutal, a steep decline in the consumption and marketplace of nuclear electricity. And the, uh, the interim decision of the Paris court was upheld by the uh, Paris Court of Appeal in July. So that's uh, <clears throat> a particular example where uh, demand, the, a sharp reduction in the demand of a particular product um, brings you into this, this uh, area that we're talking about. <clears throat> now, uh, from New York, an example of litigation about co-branded airline credit cards uh, you know the type of card uh, is issued by um, a bank and it's co-branded with an airline. And this particular case, um, Carlos, uh, this is uh, very much for, for you, I think. <clears throat> the bank was a Brazilian bank and the airline was American Airlines. And, and here, you know, uh, think back to that slide we saw and it's extraordinary really that uh, I, I find myself saying this, but um, on the 29th of March, American Airlines suspended all flights to Brazil. And anyway, the um, uh, issue in the case <clears throat> revolves around the mileage points, which the bank is obliged to purchase under the terms of the agreement. It says that uh, these points are now uh, valueless because no one can use them. And uh, uh, the, the, the kind of issues that are being argued out in front of the New York courts. There has, hasn't been any dispositive decision of the uh, court yet, but the, it, it turns on issues like contractual force majeure and frustration, both of which we've seen. Then, uh, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to go through the uh, other cases I've mentioned. I think we've, uh, uh, we've uh, looked at those already, a uh, travel port and the travel port and wax case, the business interruption case, and, and the St steel group case in Spain. But these are all about um, types of disputes. W we believe, we believe that our concern as to the risk of a plethora of disputes is fully justified. That's our belief. 
and of course we're not in, in any way through yet um, this crisis has got uh, a long way to go yet certainly so far as international trade and commerce is concerned um, and uh, uh, you know, th th that will that will um, uh, that will not come back immediately on the on the availability of a um, of a uh, one or more vaccines. Although uh, the return of confidence, which those vaccines might bring, is of course crucial to the end the the ending of this crisis. But the question is what to what to do about it. Suppose uh, we're right that this uh, is a risk. I mean, how, how should we be approaching this? Um, uh, uh, should we be looking at um, new ways of resolving disputes or should we be placing our trust in technology? <clears throat> now, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm going to be saying that uh, this is not an either or choice and that we should be doing both. But uh, let me say something about uh, the impact of technology following the out uh, outbreak of the pandemic, because this is something I've got a fair amount of personal experience uh, on, which I, I'd like to share with you. And uh, I can summarize it relatively briefly. So uh, when it comes to litigation, most of us envision that that's a process taking place in a courthouse, which indeed it normally does. As from March 2020, uh, in many countries, courthouses were closed, um, either um, completely or uh, partially. They are gradually reopening now. By the way, um, some of you would be interested to know they've completely reopened in China. They did some time ago. Uh, but for those of us who are um, still uh, coping with the, uh, the, the virus, it's been a, a gradual process. And of course, um, you know, it hasn't been a linear process. Do you, do you see what I mean? It hasn't been um, you know, all uh, a sort of gradual reopening. Unfortunately, it's been kind of a reopening and then a closing and we'll be back to reopening again um, soon. Uh, and, and a very important point from the perspective of dispute resolution is one which uh, uh, I, I know you'll immediately connect to and that is the problem of backlog. So arbitration, uh, uh, again, most of us envision arbitration um, taking place uh, physically, which it normally does. But there is this difference that routine hearings in international arbitration, uh, such as direction hearings, for a very long time have been conducted by phone. Um, but, but substantive hearings have taken place physically. Now. The pandemic has given a massive boost to the holding of hearings remotely on various different platforms. And so far as uh, I can tell from um, my um, dealings with uh, other um, judges and uh, arbitrators in other jurisdictions, this is very much, a, uh, as you'd expect, a um, global phenomenon, at least in uh, the major um, f uh, industrial and financial centers. H how did it work? Well, um, I'm talking now about commercial cases. Uh, the, uh, the, the judge um, would, would participate from outside the courts. Um, now, as the courts gradually reopen, um, per uh, perhaps from inside the courts, um, the party's lawyers would, of, of course, participate from outside the courts, uh, although um, sometimes from uh, now, from inside, sometimes from their uh, law offices, sometimes not. Protocols um, dealing with all kinds, kinds of things, such as, for example, document production, that kind of thing, and how you put um, uh, uh, documents before a court in a, a rem, rem, or an arbitral tribunal in a remote hearing. They were uh, rapidly introduced and approved. Uh, and um, 
the, the, uh, uh, um, the same applies to arbitration. Now, I'm, I'm, I have my eye on the um, clock and uh, uh, I'm afraid, uh, Louise, I'm running a little late, so I'm going to stop now. But uh, Carlos, um, could you come to the uh, last slide, please? Because this summarizes um, what, what uh, I want to end with and what I really want um, to leave with you. I said, what should we do about it? Technology, yes, really important. But we need to change our approach to dispute resolution. And the third part of the Breathing Space Project at the issue of guidelines, which came out a few weeks ago. Now, you will see on the, uh, on the slide, there's a, a link there to uh, where, the, where you can find them. I'm not going to uh, read it out, but, but those are the behaviors which, which we want to see adopted to shift from a zero sum game to uh, an approach to dispute resolution that looks for solutions. Thank you.